motivations are the things that drive us to do things every day, whether you're hungry or tired or thirsty. And um, social motivation is the idea that people in general have a motivation to engage with other people, to interact with other people. This is be something that's been very important to human survival. People tend not to survive very well when they're all on their own. And working with other people, spending time with other people is um, a pretty important strategy. So um, social motivation is sort of, I mean, it's an idea that's been around for a very long time, but I've become particularly interested in it recently because um, a social motivation theory of autism has emerged, suggesting that um, people with autism who we know have differences in many aspects of social interaction might also have differences in their motivation um, to engage with other people. Um, so they might avoid other people, they might not look at other people so much, they might not learn from other people so much. Um, it's a very interesting idea, but it hasn't been very easy to test and be able to actually pin down these kind of motivational factors. How can you actually put a number on somebody's motivation to engage with one person or another. If um, you ask people, what do you like to do on a Saturday night? Do you like to go out and to a restaurant with your friends? Do you like to have a nice meal? Or maybe you'd rather stay at home in your room and play a computer game on your own. Then the different answers you've got to that kind of question might give you some hint about people's social motivation, but it doesn't really let us put a number on it and develop a scientific theory of it. So to try and look at this, we've been trying to develop some new ways to sort of quantify motivation. Um, we've developed, for example, a task where people can choose um, between two, two or three different movies that they want to watch. Each movie is just two or three seconds long. Um, and so a social movie might be a movie of a person um, who looks at the camera and smiles and they're quite socially engaging and quite cheerful or a non-social movie might be a, um, a movie which has a little turntable with some household objects sitting on the turntable and the turntable slowly moves around so you get to see different household objects but they're not typically very interesting household objects um, and what we show to people is um, different coloured boxes so for example there's a blue box and an orange box and they know that if they choose to open the blue box they'll get to see a social movie but if they choose to open the orange box, then they'll get to see a movie of household objects. Um, and by looking at the choices people make, we can then try and actually put a number on their social motivation. How motivated are they to see the social thing? And we then make life a little bit harder for them because we make um, put a cost on some of the boxes. So sometimes if you want to open the blue box, you've got to do a sequence of three actions which is just a little bit more boring and time consuming than doing a single action. And so again, by putting these costs on, we can get measures of motivation um, and then try and quantify um, how big are the differences in motivation between different people. So we can do this in brain scanners and get an idea about how this relates to brain systems for motivation as well. We know a lot about um, brain systems that are involved in reward for non-social things. If people are getting given food, or money in brain scanners, then we know a lot about the brain systems that are activated there, but we can see if um, social rewards, like seeing smiley people, engages some of the same kind of brain systems. Um, we've also been able to look at differences in social motivation between people who do have autism and people who don't. Um, so in a study that we published recently, we um, had a group of adults who have um, autism and a group of typical adults and we gave them the social motivation task and in the task there were three different kinds of movies they could be looking at. They could be looking at movies of a person who looks straight at you and makes eye contact with you or a movie of a person who looks away from you and doesn't make eye contact um, or a movie of household objects and we find that typical people prefer the eye contact to movies without eye contact but um, the people with autism don't distinguish. But the people with autism still had a bit of a preference for the um, people over the household objects. So it's not that they avoid all people altogether, but rather maybe there's something special about eye contact um, that's different. It's often reported that people, anecdotally that people with autism avoid eye contact. They find eye contact a bit scary. Um, they're not quite sure what to make of it. And so these kind of studies are maybe providing some of the first sort of concrete evidence where we can put a number on that. 
um, and say what's the difference in terms of how people with autism um, want to look at eye contact and maybe then what use they make of it. Um, and we think understanding how many different kinds of social cues feed into motivation is going to be a really interesting thing in the future. We're also very interested in looking at eye contact in more detail and finding out what makes people seek eye contact or avoid eye contact and what are the differences, for example, between people with autism who may um, avoid eye contact and people with social anxiety disorder who also avoid seeing other people, they're not motivated to engage with other people, um, but maybe for some very different reasons. Um, so there's an increasing amount of research going on to try to uncover motivations and actually quantify them in a scientific way beyond just talking in general terms. So one of the areas that the work on social motivation leads us to think about more is um, the idea of gaze and eye contact. Gaze is often used as a measure of um, motivation because it's very simple in experimental terms to show people an image of a face or a set of images and track their eyes and see which parts of the image they look at. Um, there are many, many studies using eye tracking. Um, so for example, it's commonly been shown that if you have a photograph of a face and um, eye tracker, adult or a child looking at that image, then they'll tend to look at the eyes of the face and the mouth of the face um, rather than the hair or um, the clothing or the background. Um, whereas somebody with autism um, may not look at the eyes. This is a result that's much more controversial. Some studies find they do look at the eyes, some studies find they don't. It's been a very mixed um, kind of result, but it seems that increasingly um, if we use more naturalistic stimuli, so if instead of using a still image of a cartoon or something, we use a video of a real person who's talking, then um, there's much clearer differences between um, what typical children or adults are motivated to look at and what people with autism are motivated to look at. It's um, in terms of advancing our methods, the closer our methods in the lab get to being in the real world, um, the better the results are that we're able to find. And there's also some fascinating findings now suggesting that in um, typical people, if you um, show them just a photo of a face, then they will easily look at the eyes. But if they're seeing a video on Skype of another person and another person is looking back at them, then they won't look at the eyes so much. They look at the eyes in quite a different pattern because when you engage in a genuine social interaction with somebody, then your motivation and the cues that you're sending out um, are quite different. If you're looking at a still photo, then you can kind of look wherever you like without being embarrassed um, and just pick up any social information you like. But if you're looking at another real person, then if you stare at their eyes too long, that's going to send weird kind of social cues and um, might make the social interaction break down. So people um, will be motivated quite differently and behave quite differently in a real interaction compared to what they do in some of our typical lab studies where we're just using still images on the screen. Um, and it's becoming increasingly apparent um, in the domain of social neuroscience that we really need to study these real world interactive contexts um, in order to get good measures of motivation and good measures of people's behaviour. Um, where what we do in the lab is not um, a million miles disconnected from what's happening in the real world. So some of the very exciting work um, that's, go been go that's going on in the future um, in the last few years and happening now in terms of understanding social motivation, understanding social interaction is to get beyond sort of traditional lab methods and make things interactive so that you're looking at somebody who looks back at you, whose gaze responds to you, or um, you're measuring things outside an MRI scanner, you're measuring things um, in much, much richer, more real world contexts. And so by doing this kind of thing where we're taking neuroscience outside the lab and into the real world and into interactive contexts, we can then get much better measures of motivation and try to understand how people really are behaving and what motivates them, what drives them in everyday life and we think that that's going to give us a much better way to understand differences, um, individual differences in behaviour, not just in autism but also um, again in other conditions like social anxiety disorder, um, 
any kind of psychiatric disorders which affect social interaction, of which there's a great number, we need to really be studying social interaction in those interactive contexts. The topic of um, social motivation as a whole is very important um, for understanding individual differences in social behaviour because each person has their own motivations and their motivations may even be changing um, throughout the course of the day, throughout the course of a week, throughout the course of their life. There may be very different social motivations in adolescence compared to adulthood at a different stages of adulthood. Um, and so if we have ways to quantify these kind of things and um, have an understanding about where they're coming from, then that will give us a much better scientific basis um, on which to know why people make particular decisions in particular ways and um, how we can then help people who are struggling in social situations from a wide variety of psychiatric conditions, many of which have some kind of motivational aspect. Um, so that will be the long-term goal of this kind of research.